Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Job Accommodation Network's Accommodation and Compliance Audio and Web Training Series. I'm Linda Batiste, and I'm here with Beth Loy. Hello, everyone. Beth and I will be presenting today's program called Current Events in Accommodation. But before we get started, I want to go over just a few housekeeping items. First, if any of you experience technical difficulties during the webcast, please give us a call at 800-526-7234 for voice, hit button 5, or for TTY, call 877-781-9403. Second, toward the end of the presentation, we'll have a question and answer period, time allowing, but you can send your questions in at any time during the webcast to our email account, question at askjan.org, or you can use our question and answer pod located at the bottom of your screen. To use that pod, just type your question and then submit to the question queue. Also on the bottom of your screen, you'll notice a file share pod. If you have any difficulty viewing the slides or you just want to download them, click on the button that says Save to My Computer. You can also download the resource handout that we put together for you. And finally, I want to remind you that at the end of the webcast, an evaluation form will automatically pop up in your screen in another window. We really appreciate your feedback, so please stay logged on to fill out that evaluation form. And now let's start today's program. We have lots of exciting news to report to you today, starting on the home front. And one of the most exciting things is that on July 26th of this year, the ADA will celebrate its 30th anniversary. A lot of you may not know that JAN is even older than the ADA. We've been around for over 35 years. So we've had the opportunity to watch the ADA evolve since the very beginning. We're going to be celebrating the ADA's anniversary all year, as will our funder, the Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy, or ODEP for short. To follow all of ODEP's activities, you can bookmark their ADA anniversary page, which is dol.gov forward slash ODEP forward slash topics, forward slash ADA.htm. And you can also watch our website, which is askjan.org, to find out what we'll be doing. We're going to talk more about the ADA later, but first, more on the home front. We've had a really busy year again. In 2019, we handled over 44,000 contacts, mostly from employers and individuals with disabilities. And we're on track to surpass that number this year. Many of our contacts are taking advantage of all the different ways to reach us. Half of the contacts came in what is now the old-fashioned way via our toll-free telephone line, but the other half came in electronically through our general email account, online tool called Jan on Demand, our live chat, and our social network accounts such as Facebook, Second Live, and Twitter. Our website remained pretty popular too. In the last year, we received over 21.5 million page requests. And now I want to briefly mention some of the things that we added to our site that we think you might be interested in. First up is our series of videos that we call Solutions Showcase Videos. These are two to four minute long and describe or show how various accommodation solutions work. Currently there are videos about smart pens, speech recognition software, telephone amplification, cart or captioning services. Microsoft and iPad built-in accessibility features, and alternative mice. In the near future, we're going to be adding videos about ergonomic chairs, sit-stand workstations, accessing telephones if you use hearing aids, and color coding as an accommodation. These videos are designed to help you understand how various services and assistive technologies work so you can explore accommodation options in your workplace. And we're going to continue adding to these videos periodically. The other videos we have are called the just-in-time training videos that highlight various disability-related issues that can come up in the workplace, offering practical solutions for addressing each issue. So far, we have videos about interviewing a young person on the autism spectrum, managing an accommodation request from a veteran with a hearing impairment and post-traumatic stress disorder, managing an accommodation that surfaces during a performance review, retaining an individual with a chronic health condition, hiring an individual with an anxiety disorder resulting in a stutter, returning an employee with a back injury to work, and dealing with conduct and drug addiction in the workplace. 
And in the near future, we're going to be adding videos for individuals with disabilities, um, specifically about disclosing a disability and requesting accommodation. And all of the videos I've mentioned are free, and they're available for download anytime you need them. So feel free to check them out. We provided a link directly to them on your resource handout. I also wanted to mention a few other things that we added to our site last year, including a page on telework as an accommodation, leave as an accommodation, information for caregivers, and a training module about service and emotional support animals as workplace accommodations. We were getting a lot of questions about all these issues, so we put together some information based on these most frequent questions that we get. You can find all this and more on our A to Z page, which you're going to find right off our home page. And then the final thing I want to mention that's coming soon is MyJan. We're really excited about this edition. And basically, it's a way that you can customize and save your own web page with your favorite Jan pages. So MyJan is going to allow you to easily load a page with links to things on the Jan site that you use a lot or that you just want to have handy when you do need them. You'll be able to arrange your links by whether they're related to accommodations, legal issues, or resources. I'm really excited about this edition because I use the Jan site all the time in my day-to-day -day work. And I currently get, bring up 10 tabs every morning when I get here um, with the pages that I know I'm going to need every day. So my Jan is going to let me access all these pages easily from one customized page. So if you think this is going to be useful for you, watch for this to be available this year, right, Beth? Hopefully. Yes, and this is going to be a really cool addition because people will just have to bookmark the Jan site. So they only have one page in their bookmarks, and once they go to the Jan site and log in for their My Jan page, all of their Jan-related bookmarks will be on the one page. I'm going to be the first customer. Uh, it's, going to, it's going to make it, I think, so much easier for people who do a lot of accommodation. It definitely. It's going to make it easier for us here. Pretty excited about it. All right. On the home front, these are definitely exciting times for us, so stay tuned to the Jan website at askjan.org for more exciting news. And now here's Beth with today's business news, the Jan Cost Benefits Report. Thank you, Linda. Now, in this section, we like to look into the costs and benefits of workplace accommodation. This is the business side of implementing the ADA and Rehabilitation Act. And it, we do a study here at JAN, and once a year, we'd like to share those findings with you. We usually do it during our current events webcast. It's a study that shows that workplace accommodations are not only low cost, um, but also, guess what? They're high impact. So they positively impact the workplace in many ways. Now, we collect data from four different groups, employers, professionals, such as service providers, um, indiv individuals, and those related to self-employment. So what happens here is the cost-benefit data are often usually available from just employers, which is why we analyze these data for the costs and benefits of accommodation on a yearly basis. And this JAN study, we've been doing it since 2004, so we feel we have a pretty good sample size. And the data really doesn't change that much from year to year. Now, employers in the JAN study represent a range of industry sectors and sizes. And th what happens is they contact the JAN for information about workplace accommodation, the ADA or Rehabilitation Act, or in most cases, both. Now, employers who contact the JAN were asked if they were willing to participate in what we call a user satisfaction survey. And approximately eight weeks or so after the initial contact, the employers were asked a series of questions about the situation they've discussed with Jan and the quality of the services that Jan provided. Now, one of the exciting changes that we went through this past year is that we made this electronic. So this is this was really exciting for us because we were able to increase our sample size just by switching it from a telephone based survey to one that is electronic. And people have been really responsive to that. I'm pretty excited about that. So basically what happens now is, is it's asked electronically, and you can go in and do it at your own pace. You don't have to use a telephone. No one has to call and contact you. Um, but you do get asked, 
via email if you'd be willing to participate. So uh, what makes this survey special is that, yes, it's of people who've contacted Jan, but also it's of employers who actually have the information that we're seeking. So what happens is an external contractor provides the service for tallying the data for Jan, so that the data are collected from an unbiased researcher. In other words, we don't touch it, do we, Linda? No. Until it's done. Until it's done, and we can look at the feedback. So what's the bottom line? Well, in this case, workplace accommodations are low cost, and they make a high impact. And this trend really hasn't wavered since the inception of the Jan study. Now, best of all, Jan can help employers make workplace accommodations free of charge. So all total, the Jan follow-up study includes 2,744 employers. Now, we do plan to update that data again in September. We do it every September. And that tends to be a good time of year to do it. We feel that we have enough of a sample from the year to go forward. And we're pretty uh, sure that the data are very reliable and also valid. So the data continue to be consistent with previous years. And what I'm going to do is highlight those results that have changed just a little bit over the past year and some that have not changed. This is pretty exciting for me because I like numbers. Linda, on the other hand, I'm not too sure if she gets excited about <laughs> I like about the it. scenarios, the stories they tell. So we're going to do some stories too. So the first finding I would like to share is that employers want to provide accommodations so they can retain valued and qualified employees. Okay, so what does this mean? How do we know this? Well, of the employers who contacted Jan for accommodation information and solutions, most were doing so to retain or promote a current employee. This percentage was 85%, and that is up 3% from last year. Oh, wow. Yeah. On average, this included those persons who had just been given a job offer or who were newly hired. So that average employee had actually been with the company about seven years. That hasn't changed. Had an average wage of about $15 for those paid by the hour or an average annual salary of about $50,000. So not much change in those numbers. Now, in addition, the individuals tended to be fairly well educated, with 54% having a college degree or higher. So if we look at the average annual salary of about $51,900 for this group, that certainly didn't change much. It's always kind of fluctuated from around $50,000. So. Uh, Pretty interesting. Last year it was $15 for those who were paid by the hour. This year it's $16 for those paid by the hour. Not much change. No, not much. Okay, so next let's look at a situation that kind of highlights this. So we had a situation involving a call center employee who had diabetes. And this individual requested a change to what they considered to be a very structured break schedule to allow her to take more frequent, shorter breaks. Now, as a reasonable accommodation, this employee really needed the flexibility. The employer ended up doing that, provided the flexibility with the break times as needed. And they agreed for the break to not exceed 30 minutes of the total break time in an eight hour workday. And making this change, the employer felt cost them nothing. They just sort of compromised on what the schedule needed to be. And the employer reported the benefits from making the accommodation. And the things that were reported, first off, the method of clocking in and out for breaks allowed both the employee and the employer to monitor the use of time. So the employer was more confident, as was the employee, about how much time was being put in during the day. Now, the employer also reported that the accommodation allowed the company to retain a qualified employee and to increase her productivity and attendance. And consistent with our data, this again was a very highly educated person um, who was receiving a fairly high salary in this position. 
and the situation involved retaining the individual, and the employer did so for a very low cost, nothing, um, and all parties left the situation very satisfied. Now, the second finding I would like to share is that most employers report no cost or low cost for accommodating employees with disabilities. So, how do we determine this? Well, the employers in the study reported that a high percentage, 58%, were made at no cost. This means the accommodations cost absolutely nothing to make. Now, while the majority of the rest typically cost $500, these were one-time costs. Now, we didn't really have enough data related to ongoing costs to calculate a reliable number. Um, but again, these data just haven't fluctuated very much. We've been at $500 for several years now. Um, and over half the accommodations being about 58%, that's fluctuated very little. It's up 1% from last year. So let's look at another real life accommodation situation. This is one that involved a groundskeeper who indicated he had developed a severe allergy to bee stings. So that's a tough job to do in your emergency. Yeah. Now the employer had discovered an influx of bees on the grounds and subsequently hired a consultant to locate the nest and to develop a protocol for eradicating them. And as we all know, we don't want the bees killed. I'm not sure they have been moved to a bee farm. To a bee farm, yes, a very happy bee farm. So the employee also indicated that he did carry an EpiPen and he needed a plan of action should he be stung. So with input from the employee, the supervisors were trained on how to assist him if this type of bee sting would happen. Now, the employer reported benefits from making the accommodation, including that by making this accommodation, the employee was very happy with the accommodation, stating that it improved the groundskeeper's productivity. And the reported cost in this case was $500. Most of that had to do with um, having a plan in place to remove bees when they were found and the time taken to train the supervisors. So $500, that's a pretty reasonable cost. So our next finding, employers report that accommodations are effective. And I like this statistic because of those responding, 74% reported the accommodations were either very effective or extremely effective. And of course, this is a really high percentage. So when if you went to Vegas and you had a 74% chance of winning a million dollars. I'd be retired. Right. <laughs> yeah, me both, I think. <laughs> so the situation uh, kind of highlights the effectiveness of an accommodation. This was a bank employee, and this bank employee had fragrance sensitivity, which we get a lot of questions about. Um, she was having problems working due to irritants, such as perfume and candles and those types of scents, and she experienced nausea and migraines as a result. Now, as a reasonable accommodation, the agency did make some changes to its policy regarding the use of fragranced items. And the employer also purchased an air purifier and provided all employees with education packets about the difficulties of individuals working with fragrance sensitivities. Now, the cost for this is $200. And again, consistent with our data, the employer stated that the changes were extremely effective because the employee is now able to work without getting sick from strong fragrances and odors. Moving on. So just kind of an overall summary of the study. And we did provide a link to the study in your handout so you can go ahead and get more details if you'd like. But the study results have consistently shown that the benefits that employers receive from making workplace accommodations far outweigh the low cost. And to top off these positive results about the costs and benefits of accommodations, the employers in the study also reported that Jan was effective in helping them. So 
you know, we currently hope that what this does is it translates into very positive outcomes in the workplace when you have an individual with a disability and you contact Jan for additional information related to accommodation. Now, just to kind of keep up to date, uh, with this research, like I said, we come out with an updated publication every September. Uh, you can get it on our A to Z page, which is available from Jan's homepage, and you can go to the link um, benefits and costs under the A to Z by topic. And you'll be able to find this updated report. Like I said, we did provide you with a link to it. And now with that, let's hit into a favorite topic for all of us. Very exciting politics. So glad I don't have to do this section. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this year, as we all know, is an election year. Um, so there are a lot of things we could talk about related to politics. But we've decided to focus on our favorite legal topic, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act. As I mentioned, the ADA is turning 30 this year, so we'd like to honor it by looking at how some employers are moving beyond basic compliance and embracing the spirit of the ADA. So we're going to look at a few examples of basic ADA compliance and then some things employers can do to go beyond basic compliance to make their workplaces more inclusive of people with disabilities. So in our first example, we have an applicant for an accounting position who uses a wheelchair. When he arrived for his job interview, he found that he could not enter the building because there was a long set of stairs up to the office. So he called the employer, who apologized, and then rescheduled the interview at an accessible location. So while the employer quickly addressed the situation and, and did provide an alternative, it probably didn't make this applicant feel really welcome or included to show up for the interview and then find out he couldn't even get into the building. It basically says to applicants, we don't really expect people with disabilities to apply for jobs or work here. So what can employers do to make individuals with disabilities feel more included during the interview process? There are lots of things, but I just want to mention a few. One thing you can do is notify applicants about where and how the interview will be conducted. If you know there are barriers like stairs, um, point that out to individuals who will be coming to your workplace. Let them know ahead of time so that if they need an accommodation, they can make one, a request for one beforehand. And then provide contact information for additional questions or to request an accommodation when needed. And make sure that whoever is the contact person is responsible and does follow up with the person and actually answers the phone or email. Or even better, hold interviews in an accessible location if you can. If your facility is not accessible, um, try to find a place that is and, and hold the interviews there. Um, assume that you're going to have some people with disabilities coming to those interviews. Greet applicants at the door to identify any unforeseen accessibility issues. Even if you are in an accessible location, you may not foresee all types of accommodations. You want to think about what accommodations might be needed ahead of time. But even if you can't foresee everything, meet them at the door. You can identify any problems by greeting people as they come into your facility. So let's look at another example of minimal ADA compliance. An employer allows supervisors to decide whether to let their employees telework. So they give each supervisor discretion about whether employees can telework at all. An employee with a disability asks to telework but is denied by her supervisor who is against teleworking across the board, doesn't want any of her employees teleworking. This particular supervisor, um, of course, denies everybody telework, so it's not really discrimination to deny this person telework. The employee with a disability needs an accommodation related to telework, so it goes to HR. So HR starts the accommodation process. Um, ultimately, this employee is allowed to telework as an accommodation. Again, we have a situation where an employee got the accommodation she needed, so the employer is likely in compliance with the ADA. But this situation doesn't really promote inclusion. Um, first of all, some employees are allowed to telework without jumping through any hoops simply because their supervisors are pro-telework. They, they don't even have disabilities, they just get to telework. Then you have an employee with a disability who needs to telework because of the disability and she has to go through all this accommodation process, she has to get medical documentation, she has to do a lot more than her coworkers down the next hall that get to telework automatically. And that just really doesn't seem right. And the other thing is now she knows that her supervisor doesn't like the fact that she's teleworking, so what is their relationship going to be like? 
So this just creates all kinds of problems. So how could this employer make this situation more inclusive? Well, one thing you want to focus on is don't make employees with disabilities jump through those extra hoops. Have some kind of process for reviewing any denial um, by a supervisor. If you're going to let supervisors have discretion, the minute an employee says, well, I need to do this because of a disability, pop that up to your accommodation specialist or your designated expert to review and have that request automatically okayed rather than making the person jump through the hoops. Build accommodations into your policies if you can. In this situation with the telework policies, give them supervisor's discretion except when it's an accommodation situation. Have flexible, flexible policies for everybody if you can. Um, ideally, you'll let everybody telework equally. You'll give flexible schedules equally. You'll allow leave equally. And this will reduce the need for accommodations because your policies are going to cover a lot of the things that people would otherwise have to request. Another example, and, and this is one we've been hearing a lot about in the last couple of years, an employer gives sit-stand workstations to any employees who request them. And guess what? Everybody wants one, and all of a sudden, it's too expensive to continue giving them out to everybody. So the employer decides to only give them if needed for a disability, decides to take the workstations away from everybody who already has one so they don't have to buy any new ones, and then provides information about how to request one as an accommodation, and then gives them back out to people with disabilities on a case-by-case -case basis. Again, there doesn't appear to be an ADA compliance issue here because the employees with disabilities can request the types of workstation that they need to accommodate their disabilities, and the employer is giving them those workstations. But think about how this might affect their relationship with coworkers. They're going to see who's getting those sit-stand workstations that they had, and now they know that theirs was given away to somebody else and they don't have one. And not only is this going to possibly build resentment, but indirectly this is disclosing that certain employees have disabilities and the coworkers may develop a negative view about the ADA and accommodation. So this kind of situation, we're hearing about it a lot, but I think it's a really tough one to dig yourself out of. So how can you handle this differently? Well, ideally, you want to think about this before. Don't set this up this way. Um, think about whether you can afford to give everybody a sit-stand workstation before you say anybody can have one. But once you're in this situation where you didn't realize it was going to get too expensive and you've been giving them out, one thing you could consider is grandfathering in the employees who already have the workstations. Instead of yanking them from people and building that resentment, let everybody who already asked for one have one and then move forward from there. If you don't want to do that, at least don't remove the workstations until you go through the accommodation process because you're, you may be removing them from people that need them in order to do their work or to comfortably do their work, and they're going to have to wait out the process before they can get their accommodation back in place. Consider practicing universal design. Build in your workstation so that they're flexible. Um, provide ergonomic workstations if you can so that you can adjust them according to what each individual employee needs. If you can't do everything ergonomic and, and flexible and universally designed, at least provide some ergonomic equipment for everybody. That can go a long way, um, especially if you're going to be handing out workstations that not everybody can have. Here's another example we hear a lot. An employee is addicted to drugs and decides it's time to finally get some help. So he goes to an employer, he indicates that he's addicted to illegal drugs, and he says, I want to get help. I need some leave time to go to rehab. This particular employer has zero tolerance policy for illegal drug use and decides to terminate the employee under the policy. As you probably know, illegal drug users are not protected under the ADA when an employer acts on the illegal use and doesn't just single out employees who become addicted. So anytime this employer finds out someone's illegally using drugs, addicted or not, fires them. So technically, the employer can just fire any employee illegally using drugs. At least the ADA is not going to prohibit it. How does this look to employees with addiction problems or their coworkers? It basically sends a message that the employer doesn't want to give employees a chance, so other employees are not likely to come forward and try to get help when maybe they really need it. You know, this could be a problem in the workplace if you, your employees have problems like this and they can't come and ask for help and they just try to keep pushing through. So what are some more inclusive options? 
allow leave when an employee voluntary, voluntarily comes forward and wants to get help. Maybe you want to modify your zero tolerance policy and say, unless someone voluntarily discloses and comes and asks for help, then we're going to give them a chance. And if you don't want to risk liability, some employers use a last chance agreement, and that's basically saying, we're going to give you this chance, but here's what you need to do. We could terminate you under our policy, but we don't want to. We want to give you one chance, and here's, here's what we expect from you. Um, allow all employees a chance for sponsor treatment. Um, a lot of times employees can't go get rehab or go get treatment unless you cover that under your insurance. It's a very inclusive workplace. Consider sponsoring treatment that people need. Provide an EAP if you have that opportunity, um, employee assistance program, or any other workplace supports that you can provide. All of these things show that you care about your employees and you're trying to let them help themselves. And I want to just talk about one final example before we move on. Here we have an employee with PTSD who was allowed to bring his service dog to work. His coworkers see the dog, of course, and start asking questions about why that employee gets to bring his dog to work. The supervisor responds by saying she will not discuss another employee with coworkers. And this is appropriate for the supervisor to say. Um, the ADA's confidentiality rules don't allow employers to disclose disability related information to coworkers. But what's going to happen here? Again, coworkers may resent the employee, or they may unknowingly interfere with the work the service animal is performing for the employee by trying to interact with it because they don't know it's a service animal. What's a more inclusive alternative here? One thing is to provide options for how to respond to coworkers. Maybe the supervisor could say a bit more, um, like we have a policy of respecting employee privacy, so we can't discuss this with you, but if you have any personal issues you'd like to discuss, please let me know. <clears throat> Turn it back on the employee. Don't just say, shut up, I'm not going to talk to you. Even better, ask employees with disabilities if they want to voluntarily educate coworkers, and I mean voluntarily. As long as it's voluntary, you can invite employees with disabilities to educate their coworkers. This employee doesn't really need to go into detail about the disability, but could educate coworkers about the service animal and how to appropriately interact with it. And then you can always do general disability awareness and etiquette training. Um, you don't want to just focus on service animals without um, talking with the employee with disability, but in general you can do disability awareness and etiquette training. If you're interested in more ideas about making your workplace more inclusive for people with disabilities, take a look at our uh, workplace accommodation toolkit. There's a wealth of information in the toolkit, and that is free, uh, linked on our resource handout that we made for you under the politics section. So the ADA is making headline news, as always, and it looks like it's going to continue to do so for a while as it moves into its 30th year. So stay tuned to the JAN website for all the breaking political and legal news. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Beth for my favorite part of the program, and that's exciting developments in the world of technology. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> Just make it good. <laughs> yeah. So let's go ahead and dive in here to some different types of technologies that are very new and some that aren't even on the market yet. First here, we have something called the WeWalk Smart Tank. And this was developed by... Uh, the Young Guru Academy in London, England. It's a brand new digital product. It combines a traditional mobility cane with smartphone technology. It will detect obstacles um, using an ultrasonic sensor. It can control your smartphone via touchpad that's on the cane. And it will receive turn-by-turn -turn Google Map navigation. Wow, that's a good start. Yes. It is an open platform, so it can actually be integrated in the future with Uber and even Alexa. Wow. Yeah. So this is going to be some exciting uh, developments with this product, I think. Because cool. imagine how you could link this to your Uber and how you could talk to Alexa and then Google's giving you directions and you probably still end up lost like <laughs> I do. Um, but, you know, this is just a great invention to be able to interact with all these other apps and things that we have on our smartphones. Next product, this is called a Segway S-Pod. Oh, I need one of those. 
don't we all? <laughs> it is an electric vehicle. Um, it's considered a personal transportation vehicle. Um, it will be available in 2021. There is no price yet. You can go up to 24 miles per hour, um, but I'm sure if you found a farmer, uh, the farmer could modify that, get you going a little faster. Uses a joystick instead of the traditional Segway leaning of the body. Um, has a little joystick there on the side. It, it's basically a seat on wheels and it self balances. Now, Segway claims that you cannot tip this thing. Oh, wow. We can challenge that. I know. And really, this is going to be very useful for individuals who, say, work in malls or airports or at amusement parks and have to walk long distances at certain times during the day. Um, you can also use, a ta use it with a tablet, and the tablet fits down in the armrest, and you can use the tablet to control it. It is about 260 pounds. Uh, it's 60 inches in height and um, can handle about 300 pounds. So. I'm going to have to sell my car. Pretty interesting stuff, I think. Get me one of those. Okay. This next one is an accessible escalator. And this has been designed in Japan. It is unique to that country so far. Basically, what happens with this escalator is that three steps stay at the same height to create a platform, and those steps are painted in blue. And what happens is a person comes and clicks a button on the escalator, and it, that platform levels out. And the platform is leveled with that special color, and the person with the wheelchair can um, go onto that platform. Oh, wow. Yeah. It'd be handy at the airport with your luggage, too. Uh, yeah. And it to prevent you from going backwards or forwards, there's a five-centimeter block that comes up once you're on it. Because the escalator has to stop in order for you to get on it. And then once you're on it, this five-centimeter block comes up to block you in, uh, prevent you from rolling forward or backwards. Right now, you do need a staff assistant stop and start the escalator and it's not on the market yet but you can certainly see a lot of potential for that. Oh yeah, that's neat. This next product is called Sign IO Gloves. Um, this was developed by an engineer in Kenya for his six-year-old niece who is deaf. His family was having trouble communicating with her. And Alila, the engineer, decided he was going to develop these gloves. And these gloves translate signed hand movements into audible speech. So the gloves can recognize hand and finger movements and translate the movements to a smartphone app via Bluetooth. The gloves have sensors on each finger. And once to the smartphone, the text-to-speech function on the smartphone will translate it into speech. Amazing. So you put the gloves on, you speak in sign, and it goes from the gloves to the sensors, to the smartphone, to the text-to-speech on the smartphone, and back out in speech. No price on that yet, as they're not on the market yet either. Here's a new kind of smartwatch. This is called the Dot Watch by Dot Incorporation. Um, this watch is actually powered by magnetism, and you can go 10 days without a charge, which that in itself, I think, is new. <laughs> um, it's basically a Braille smartwatch. It has Braille and tactile response. It gives you time, the date. You can set an alarm. Uh, has a full feature clock, has a timer with a stopwatch and a calendar. And it'll also uh, translate your text messages into Braille. It'll vibrate and 
display the name of a caller or the name of a person who's emailing you. Cost of this is only four hundred dollars. Is it available then? Yeah, it is. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. Next, we have the AirPods from Apple, and these aren't really new, but there is kind of a hidden feature with the AirPods that not many people use, and this is called Live Listen, and you can go to actually the control center um, of your smartphone or your iPad or whatever you're using to use your AirPods. And you can activate what's called the live listen. And that then you can take and place the device, like your smartphone, in front of, say, a person that you want to hear at a meeting. Then what happens is, as the person talks into your smartphone, you can hear it through the AirPods in your ears. So, you know, Linda, if we're... In a meeting and there's a lot going on, there's a lot of background noise or something, like there was in our meeting this morning. If you're at one end of the table speaking, I could simply take my smartphone down, put it in front of you. I could go back to my seat at the other end of the table with my AirPods, could turn on live listen, and I could hear you just as if you were sitting next to me. That's great. You can carry it with you all the time. It's a small little accommodation. Uh, price on those is about $170, um, unless you want the Porsche version of them, and then the price kind of goes up. Okay, next product that we have, this is the Livio AI hearing aids. These are touted to be very effective in noisy environments. The other thing this does is it can track body and brain health which I'm not too sure I want mine tracked, but <laughs> what it will do is if you fall, it will send a fall alert. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it also has different adjustments on it that you can pre-program based on the environment. So say you work in a manufacturing facility and you go from an area that's kind of noisy, you can set that area as one, you can set your meeting environment as two. If you go into the kitchen and interact with your coworkers, you can set that as three. Um, and when you go home and you don't want to hear your kids or your spouse, you can just turn it off. <laughs> Speaking from personal experience there. <laughs> so that kind of makes it neat that you can program it based on the environment you're in and for individuals um, who may have problems with falls, or we may worry about them, or they may just work individually. Oh, yeah, that's that's really good for that. Um, and it can notify somebody else? Yes. That, yeah. yeah. Price of these, a little pricey. Not really for hearing aids, but still a little pricey. 2500 to $3,000. Next product. This is a Mark II wearable glove barcode scanner. <clears throat> Basically, this uh, replaces the heavy scanner um, that you see people using when they have to twist and turn or even the hand scanner um, where they have to use the trigger motion. So this will replace those heavy and clunky scanners. You can connect this as well with Bluetooth. You can get 6,000 scans on this thing or 15 hours of battery. And the scanner is on the back of your hand. And it's really good for, um, say, packing stations or processing um, different types of boxes and things like that, that where you ship a lot. And on the back of the hand, you can track what's happening to your package instead of having to move back and forth from a scanner to a control monitor. So you know how, like, when we go grocery shopping, you'll notice the person puts it over the scanner, sometimes has to rescan it with the hand, sometimes has to enter it manually, and then has to turn and make sure that it went into the tally in the register. This will do it all in one swipe, and you can track what's happening and if it went into the system right on your wrist. 
price of these for each glove is a thousand bucks. Next one, uh, this is kind of a cool product for a person that has to change a lot of tires, and that would be me. I go through a lot of tires. We have very bad roads here in West Virginia. And also on the farm, we go through a lot of tires. This thing is called a tire spouter. It will allow you to change the tire without taking the wheel and tire off of the vehicle. I mean, it you save your back. Makes me speechless. So it's considered a mobile handheld tire changer. And you just roll it along, you hook it to the wheel, off comes the tire, and you can put on a new tire. Amazing. Thirty five hundred to four thousand dollars for this. But if you change a lot of tires, it would certainly be worth it. Next product, another industrial project. This is called a storm floor scraper. This is a floor scraper for things like carpet, wood, vinyl. I don't know if anyone's ever taken up vinyl, the old time vinyl. It's like a nightmare. Um, anything like that that you have on your floor, you can do it while sitting. So instead of having to use like a crowbar or a scraper or something like that, a person can get on this and this floor scraper will do the job for you. Um, these run, you know, depending on what you get, anywhere from three to $5,000 or so. It is controlled by a single joystick. Um, they market it as having a very precise blade so you can adapt the blade to what you're scraping, like a like I said, if it's carpet or wood or whatever. Also, it has an app with it, of course, and that app will monitor the charge to it since it's um, basically rechargeable battery for that. That saves your back, saves your wrist, saves all kinds of things. It has to be a larger space, of course, uh, but you could definitely see for like large venues where that would be beneficial. Uh, next one, this is a product actually Linda found. This is called a power wrench. This is a, what they call a portable valve actuator that runs on air. So you can hook it to um, air and it gives you a lot more power to open up specifically valves. So these are valves that without something like this can take up to one to two hours to open. Uh, of course, that gets the time down to one or two minutes. Uh, this is a device that's certified for various industries um, as safe. And as you can tell, it would have to be safer than standing over the valve because with this device, you can stand sort of to the side of the valve. So if something did happen, give you a little bit of space um, between the device and yourself. So it runs about $3,000 and up. Uh, they make different sizes for different size valves. So pretty good product there for someone who works in that environment. And the last product that I have, kind of a fun product, this is a chord assist guitar. It was designed by a gentleman named Joe Birch, and he has retinitis pigmentosa, and he needed some adaptations to be able to continue to play the guitar. Now, this guitar is considered accessible. It has a built-in computer that actually uh, attaches to the cloud. It will give you LCD display. It will give you a Braille display, and it will also give you a voice speaker. And you can have conversations with this guitar, much like you do with Alexa. So you can ask the guitar, can you show me a B flat? And the guitar will show you a B flat, both visually with an LCD and with Braille. I think it's an amazing invention. It is. 
And the price is two sixty to four hundred dollars. Made it real reasonable. Yeah, that is reasonable. Said he wasn't in it, you know, to make money. He was just in it to be able to do something accessible. So pretty, pretty fun device, I think, for people who are interested in music and playing the guitar. Okay, and with that, that wraps up our technology section. And how are we going to wrap it up, Linda? We are going to wrap it up. We've got actually a couple more sections. We're just going to go through them pretty quickly. And thanks for the wonderful technology. I always love that part. Well, we're going to do living, and then we're going to do real short sections yeah. on the world. Yep. So this year in the living section of our broadcast, we're going to be talking about living and working. Employees with disabilities, as you all know, have the same life issues to deal with that we all do related to working, getting to work, dealing with caretaking issues if you're a caretaker, handling the myriad of problems that come up in your personal life. But employees with disabilities may have additional things that they have to deal with. For example, like taking medication, dealing with the effects of the medication, finding transportation when they can't drive, handling extreme fatigue, dealing with changes in the workplace that create barriers, all kinds of different things that can come up related to disability-related limitations. What we're going to talk about today is whether employers have any duty under the ADA to provide accommodations to help employees with disabilities deal with these extra issues. A lot of you probably know that the ADA requires covered employers to provide reasonable accommodations so employees with disabilities can perform the essential functions of their job. But a lot of people are not always so clear about other reasons employers might have to provide accommodations. One of the questions we get at Jan over and over is whether an employer must ever provide an accommodation for an employee who is adequately performing his job. And the answer is yes. There are many situations in which an employer must consider accommodations even though an employee is able to perform all essential job duties. And we're going to share, you, uh, share with you some examples. Employees might need accommodations to maintain their health even though they can currently perform all essential functions. The logic here is that if they don't maintain their health, they're not going to be able to continue performing their jobs. Or another way you can look at it is that employees with disabilities should have the same opportunity as other employees to work without negatively impacting their health. Let me give you a few examples to illustrate what I'm talking about here. An employee with a mental health impairment must avoid undue stress or she'll have a flare-up of her symptoms. So she's allowed to take a short break whenever she starts to feel overwhelmed. And once she takes a break, she can go back to work. An employee with diabetes must eat several small snacks, snacks throughout the workday to maintain his blood sugar levels. So he's allowed to eat at his desk, even though company policy is that no one can eat at their desk. An employee with epilepsy is allowed to bring a service animal to work to help warn him that a seizure is about to occur, even though the company has a policy against animals in the workplace. An employee with a sleep disorder is excused from rotating shifts so she can maintain a regular sleep pattern so she can work effectively. All right, another area in which employees might need accommodations is when they have trouble getting to and from work because of their disabilities. While employers do not have to actually transport employees to work, unless, you know, if you transport all employees to work, then you're going to have to provide accommodations related to transportation. But let's say you don't provide transportation to and from work. Then you don't have to provide transportation for employees with disabilities. But what you do have to do is consider other accommodations when an employee's disability makes it difficult or impossible to get to work. And those accommodations might include schedule modifications or, or telework. Underlying reason why employers may have to provide this type of accommodation is that employers typically control the schedules and the work locations. So when a schedule or a work location is the barrier, the employer must consider reasonable accommodations to overcome that barrier. So let's look at some examples. An employee with lupus and fatigue has difficulty maintaining stamina at work because of a long commute. Most of her job can be done from home, so she's allowed to telework several days a week to help reduce her fatigue. An employee who is blind uses public transportation and is only available at certain hours of the day, so his employer changes the employee's schedule so he can access the public transportation. An employee with a gastrointestinal disorder has to use the restroom frequently and often without much notice. This makes it difficult for him to commute to work because there's no place to stop and use the restroom. 
he's allowed to transfer to an office closer to his home that is along a route with public restrooms. In all these cases, these employees could do their job, but they couldn't get to work to do them. Here's another area in which an employer might have to consider providing accommodations, even though an employee is performing his job adequately. For some people with disabilities, they can do their jobs, but it takes a lot of effort to do it because of their disability. In this type of case, the employer has a duty to consider accommodations so the employee can perform his job without struggling. An example is an employee with a learning disability must work extra hours to get all of his work done to get he has trouble reading. So it takes him a long time to read the materials that he needs to read. His employer provides screen reading software to make it easier for the employee to access information so he can get his work done as efficiently as coworkers without disabilities. An employee with cumulative trauma has difficulty typing. She's meeting the minimum productivity standards, but she wants to work at a higher standard in the hopes of receiving a promotion. Her employer provides speech recognition software for data input to increase her typing speed and an ergonomic workstation that enables her to work faster. In some cases, issues arise in the workplace that create temporary barriers for employees with disabilities. For example, an employee with chemical sensitivity who's allowed to work from another location while the office is being painted and new carpets are off-gassing. An employee uses a wheelchair and works on the third floor of the work site is given paid leave until the office elevator is repaired. And an employee with multiple sclerosis and temperature sensitivity is giving a given a portable air conditioner and a cooling vest to use until the central air conditioning is repaired. So the employees in all the examples that I mentioned are performing their jobs, but their employers have to still consider accommodations under the ADA. In addition to being legally required accommodations, these types of accommodations promote the inclusion of people with disabilities in all aspects of employment. As I discussed earlier, inclusion is kind of the, the way we're heading now. And that's the news about living and working. Stay tuned to the JAN website for all the latest news. And now back to Beth to round out the show with the World Report. And we're going to talk about the coronavirus. Um, just a little bit about the coronavirus. It does not have anything to do with the beer you drink. <laughs> I don't know, people. Uh, so the history of coronavirus is goes back to the late 1960s. The coronaviruses that we're familiar with include SARS and MERS, and this new one is called Wuhan. And the virus is named after crown-like appearances of the projections on the surface when you look under a microscope to analyze it. It is basically a severe acute respiratory syndrome. It uh, is related to coronaviruses discovered in bats. There was some research that tried to tie it to snakes, but that's been discounted as of right now. Um, the epidemic, quote unquote, uh, began in Wuhan, China on December 12, 2019. It is spread by airborne droplets of fluid and it can be deadly uh, for individuals. Now, why is this important for current events and accommodation? Well, you know that dealing with communicable diseases in the workplace is really scary, but you need to remember that the ADA could apply to the situation and you want to keep the rules in mind. And the first thing you want to remember is make decisions based on facts. You need to, to look at what is actually happening, happening, not speculation because it's scary. So under the ADA, employers are allowed to make decisions based on actual safety concerns, but they have to be real. So you want to sort out what's going on. And remember, when you're sorting out what's going on, the ADA medical exams and inquiry rules apply. In this type of situation, in order to ask medical questions or require a medical exam, you have to have a reasonable belief based on objective evidence that a specific employee might pose a direct threat. So you can't just go asking all employees medical questions or putting them through medical screening without any evidence of exposure or symptoms. So the best thing to do is rely on the experts to guide you. You want to get information from your public health authorities like the World Health Organization or the CDC. They're closely monitoring the situation and they're providing updated information for employers all the time. And don't forget, even if a direct threat exists, employers have to consider whether there might be accommodations to re reduce or eliminate the threat. Beth, you want to talk about what those could be? Sure. And some of those we are pretty familiar with. 
uh, if we do accommodation. And that can be something like a modified break schedule, uh, removal of marginal function, flexible scheduling, leave, and telework. And I think what we got to think about here is, you know, if an individual ha has an active virus, they might need one type of accommodation, like telework or leave. And if they're recovering from the virus afterwards, the stamina is going to be very low and they may need accommodations such as like a modified break schedule, the removal of marginal functions to return to work and some flexible scheduling. So it's not just about when it's active, it's after the individual is hopefully recovering from the virus. So with that, we'd like to wrap our webcast for today. Um, you can stay tuned for different types of world news at our website at askjan.org. And again, we provide a list of links for you in the handout today. If you really want to stay up to date, be sure to sign up for our newsletter off of our website. And remember, you can always contact Jan uh, anytime. And with that, Linda and I would like to say thank you for attending. Just a reminder that you will receive uh, a, an evaluation form. And certainly we would like to thank everyone who tuned in today. This is one of our favorite presentations to do every year. We get excited about it. So if you need additional information or you want to discuss something that we talked about in the webcast, please feel free to contact us. We do thank you for attending. Thank you also to Alternative Communication Services for providing the net captioning. We do hope the program was useful. And as mentioned earlier, an evaluation form will automatically pop up on your screen in another window. If you don't have your pop-ups blocked as soon as we're finished, we will send you one afterwards in addition to that one. We do appreciate your feedback, so we hope you'll take a minute to complete the form. This concludes.